than this thing, and this thing, and this thing. So you can see there are weird things you haven't seen before, right? So what do we have here? Aboriginal legend of an Aboriginal map. Then this, we have Aboriginal paintings, which very often are a map because their stories actually related to the land and practices. This, I don't know, maybe it is also one of the maps. Then we have here, what is it? How to get to our campus, how to get to our school, right? We could, I wish I could spell here, so it's places here. Then there is this thing, then there is two different maps, you know, and then there is two different ways of, uh, this is the indigenous again, um, uh, ways of mapping, of uh, reading the map. So this is the legend. There are different types of maps, right? Oh my God. And then there is these things. So the world is big. So this is, I prepared it because I thought to myself, one day we're gonna do that, but I wasn't sure about today. I'm gonna remove my email. So, what I did, I said to students today, do you know anything about google.com? And they said everything. We know everything about google.com. So, I was really happy because I need my students to know. And we went to the map. And then you can't see the whole map because I made the screen small. Because if I make the screen big, you so, you know, in Google Maps, how to use it, you just type the name of the place you're interested in. And I'm always interested in one name because my student works there. So I write primary, oh no, para, para primary. So imagine you sit with the children and we're just going to look where we are, right? Oh my God, where are we? Um, we lost each other, so primary again, power up, I have to do something, I've done something, power up primary. So we're here, and then if you actually, so we go like, what does, we can actually discuss what it all means, what the map is, and then we can take them to here, and they can have a look at the map, I think that's the power up, or here, all right? And then we can play with the resolution of it, except that I'm work. Okay, so that we can play with the resolution, make it a bit um, bigger. Oh my god, this is really good. You can see the swimming pool on the left, and uh, the school is bigger, right? And then we can actually see, check the activities we do. Now, where do we go? We go to the pool. This is a tennis court. This is more. This is the children's pool. And then where do we live? Where do we live? And you can play. You can play and play. See how you're learning about the community where you live? Oh, my God. It's bigger than my house. I knew that because I travel with my father and mother and friends and all of that. Right. Until And actually, you have prepared this, of course before. So the things that I'm going to tell you about, you already have prepared. So for example, you could actually take them to this place here. Oh, not here. This is like a bus stop or something, somewhere here. And as we actually close down on it, we will find out, we could actually go to Street View now, and we would find out, for example, that this is a an HK Center. Oh my God, what's an HK Center? We could have a look at pictures and find out what an HK Center is, hey? We could. It is amazing what would turn out. And then, once we know about the HK Center, we might actually go and have a look at it. Do you see how I'm drawing people, children now, or students, on learning about their community? At, um, so, we've lost it a little bit. Okay, so we, so I'm drawing them to actually learn about their community, and they go to this HK Center, they meet up with HK Centers, and the, and the, your HK Center has the director who runs it, but then also you have activity officers there, and activity officers actually look after the well-being of the patients, of the residents, so they create lots of activities, and part of our HK Center activity officer is actually that they have to have PD, and they also have to create community relationships, just like you. Activity officer in the residential HK Center has no different obligations as you than you do in schools. 
create community relationships and all of and create activities that are actually supporting as um, the residents in their well-being. All right. So what you might do is actually create, discuss it with the activity officer what you want them to actually show to children, bring the children there, and the people could actually show to little children pictures of themselves, for example, from when they were 20, maybe when they were five. Oh my God, isn't this amazing? What could we do with this? We might actually even, you know, borrow some of them or put them on the internet, you know, or, or on the disc, somehow scan them or whatever and put them on the disc in the HK center together we could do them and what can we do with this what can we do and you just as you actually engage with children what you actually want them to do you engage them in the task of doing something for their HK residents for example what they could do is creating what we call a vignette a vignette is a basically a video or a PowerPoint in PowerPoint you can create it and then make it into a movie so basically what children do, they create a little story of, uh, of, a li of the life of one of the residents and each of them can do of, the, of a different resident, right? And then you, you can, they, they can use descriptors uh, to title those pictures. They can use you know, I mean, your imagination now here, what they can use. Now we will be discussing throughout the semester how you actually support an activity of this kind but you can see that if you ever wanted uh, an activity that is um, that is driven by that is actually uh, engaging students or something. Can you still see my screen? Yes, you can. So if you wanted ever an activity which is actually encompassing different um, aspects of of our community engagements and which is be community oriented and which actually also so it's community oriented that's sustainability and then other aspects that you could engage is for example some of the residents will come from different countries and what you can actually in as students are creating those vignettes, they could create audiobooks. They could create anything, right? For or uh, stories. Uh, they could decorate the HK Center with um, stuff, right? So there's a lot of things that children can actually do for an HK Center. Now, as they actually, for, let, but but let's stick to the vignette, which is a story about someone's life. As they actually do that, and you could do it with preliterate children. You can do it with preliterate children, and I have actually included um, in the modules different tricks of how to use technology in order to actually uh, make things like this possible, as even when you work with little children like four or five year olds. Anyway, but if you have uh, residents that are in Asia, I mean Asian re residents. Or if you want it, if you don't, but you still would like some of these stories to be communicable, communicable, whatever it is, comprehensible to people who speak languages other than English, for example, any of the Asian languages, you just simply, whatever story they produce, whatever text children produce in the vignette, you go to the Google Translator and they will copy and paste. So they, they paste their English text and they will get Vietnamese, Cambodian, Indonesian and all of that. They don't have to understand it. But the fact that they grow awareness that there are different alphabet systems, that people function in different alphabet systems, and that the fact that they paste it, it draws them, it, draws, it not only teaches them awarenesses, and, 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 but also respect. Respect that people actually um, do not have to be one way so they have respect the, the grow respect for other ways of being so as you can see and they also as they have these people in the hk center of different of different looks from different countries they learn also about how people how different people look how different what different clothes they wear maybe they were raised in indonesia but now they are in australia so they could actually have a look how the roads looked like how the houses used to look in indonesia they could actually maybe go to google and collect now pictures of the same places where these residents were living back then 
And now how these places, those little towns look like, the same maybe places. So you go on Google, Google Maps and you do that. Now you can see and that what we discussed today, right in the third, elect, uh, third hour, was actually the, the possibility that one can do more than just exercise, uh, you know, phonics when you learn, when you actually work with children uh, to, and, and aim to support their literacy skills. Another thing that we did was, as we actually are learning about about the concept of the map, we also learned that the map is not a map. A map is always created by a, it's a cultural artifact, right? So for example, Aboriginal maps, what's the function of, oh, I have two of them, isn't it lovely? So what's the function of the Aboriginal map, right? It's, it's, it's pardon me? To tell the story, so the land so everyone, so, so we have we have lines. We, our maps are lines about the land, but their their maps, they have so the, so they relate um, to the land in terms of the stories, right? So for example, this is how the so the, so there is the kangaroo land, and this is the emu land. This is the emu land in dry season. This is the kangaroo land in dry season or in the wet season, and these are. So the, so the land is divided into stories and also into seasons and God knows into what. I'm not indigenous enough to actually tell you, but I have actually met some of the most famous painters in, when I lived in Canberra, Aboriginal painters, and I actually went to their workshop and I learned a little bit. So, so, this, so, so, the, so the land is not divided into lines, but is divided into stories, the stories by which they live and the, sto the stories which regulate their life. So our stories, which regulate our life, are here. We have roads. These people don't necessarily have roads, but they have they have they have things they do in the land, right? So same function, which is orientation of oneself in the land, but because the purpose is a little bit different, because we don't do what Aboriginal people do, therefore the map reflects a different way of organization. And it's very interesting. We had also international students today in uh, our on campus lecture. And I asked them, how did the map, for example, in Indonesia or in East Timor look like before the Portuguese landed there? I mean, you ask me, how did the Polish people draw maps before we had the map like this one? I haven't got a clue. I think we always had it like that. You know, like we always spoke Polish, like we were always blonde or brown or whatever, you know? I mean, honestly, I have no idea. But because I am limited, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually check the internet and learn how the maps looked like in ancient times, where the maps in the West always lines and the maps somewhere else stories, where stories everywhere. I mean, only Aboriginal cultures had maps which were like stories. I mean, I have no idea. Do you? I'll challenge you. So, But you see, when we actually look at the learning experience that we do create for children as a macro task, you can see how the things like sustainability, but in the term of community, or I call it for lack of a better word, I call it community orientation, learning about your community. And here, I don't mean just parents. I mean, really, you know, one day you would take children to the Red Cross, one day you'd get can take them to the HK center. Another day, you take them to some other cultural community where people actually, where children can have an opportunity to explore what's going on and address maybe people's needs. And definitely, one of the needs that the HK residents have is company, company and entertainment. And you know, little children are, are a rare sight in an HK center, and they. They will be absolutely delighted. And if little children did something for older people, whether it's a book or a play or paintings or, um, or the vignettes um, of their life stories, I mean, Im imagine that. And I'll tell you another thing. Every week, HK centers run uh, community days. And every so often, they have an open day where older people sit around and display something that they are interested in. And how do I know? Because I've done voluntary work in HK centers and I also worked uh, part-time for Council on the Aging. 
which is a, a, an NGO, non-government organization in Canberra. And I also, because I am, you know, whatever I am, I did particular things with HK centers and I provided services, usually technology-based. Anyway, what I'm aware of that happened, a guy came from uh, for a conference in Melbourne, he came from America, and he actually was talking about projects like this. And he was saying, even though the activity officers takes, um, take all the people through online games, because the online games do miracles to all the people, like they keep their brains alive, and sometimes they really just take them through the, from the depression into some sort of um, act engagement. So that's all good, he says. But when there was an open day in that particular age care center he was actually talking about, the lady whose family created a vignette for her, for her, sat in her wheelchair and on the open day she didn't want to engage the games she didn't want to show that she can play all she was doing is over and over again i will read that message soon Leanne. over and over again the lady was um the lady was just sorry this what had an idea the lady was basically showing over and over again the the vignette she was so proud for people to learn that she actually used to be young and this is how she looked and this is what she used to do and this is who she was and so on right so it was amazing it was about her self-esteem really and and also a way of uh, connecting others with herself right because nothing hurts more than loneliness and feeling irrelevant you know when people feel irrelevant and ignored their brain has actually uh, um, the mapping on the brain that ha activation on the map on the brain is the same as when they are in pain so you know loneliness and lack of connections and so on kills it just simply kills i used to be a girl guide leader and we used to talk our girls to take our girls hk center at least once a year to engage them absolutely and it's amazing what children also learn is uh they actually get to experience age. They also get to experience how, um, and, you know, their grandmothers. I mean, let's face it, I'm 50 something. I could have been the grandmother of, t of a teenager pretty much, right? So, well, sort of. What I'm saying is those grandparents are not as old of those children. So it's, 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 it's a different category of old age, right? It's like their great grandparents. Um, but might be living in Melbourne while you are in Darwin or something like that, so they don't actually see them that often. So it's really a good connection as well. So they learn about age, they learn how to give, they actually get an, emo an emotional um, satisfaction out of it themselves, they learn about cultures, they learn about languages, they learn about how to actually, I mean, you know, eventually you might, they might be even able to actually say some things in Asian, in any of the Asian languages or Aboriginal languages as they actually are creating these vignettes or audio books and so on. So it's a fully, totally social task. I'll just retry. Considering the complete lack of respect some kids have to elder, that's a great idea. Yeah, it doesn't come from nowhere, right? We usually, don't like that which is unfamiliar right uh, as someone said somewhere on Facebook or somewhere I mean they said it's really hard to be angry with someone you know or kill or some oh it's really hard to kill someone you really know I mean unless you're a psychopath right but it's really hard so as you can see I would be actually so I'm taking you through a, a little bit of a peak for the next 10 weeks or uh, eight weeks of our un of our semester to show you where it all is going. So for example, even this little discussion that we're having so far, when you actually are thinking of your assignment one, in assignment one, the question is, can you reflect on experiences you had as being taught literacy or you've seen literacy being taught? So can you ex make some comments? And then in reflections, you talk about where to from here, so this gives you a bit of a insight about the, what, what is called often authentic tasks, but it's not often actually done in an authentic way. But I will show you how many things are possible and how much this map, as we work with it, will help us to actually create support activities for children to actually do it and do it well and in a learner-oriented way and with satisfaction. And they always feel at every step supported. 
all of this I give you before I come back. To, I'll just come back to this slide soon. What I give you through this, this is not just this is not just a structure how to design a learning experience. This is also a structure which materials you will put in for children to explore in order to be able to do it. And once you actually have a map of what you have actually facilitated to support children in this macro task, you have a map of how to assess it. So what basically this little graph gives us, it not only an experience on, not only a, a, a graph to reflect on our literacy experiences, it's a graph now to also reflect on how we will design learning experiences and assess. It's our little map. Now, I don't want to actually overload you this week and give you all the 12 weeks in one lesson because you still have the two hours to watch that I will upload shortly on YouTube as soon as I actually get offline because I only finished teaching at 4 o'clock my time. I came here, had something to eat and taught again. So I'll upload the two lecture, two hour lecture. So it will be in two parts. Um, but this is, this is a kind of peek uh, ahead. Where are we going with all of this? And what we're going away is a, is, a, is a pedagogy where all of us were sitting looking at one book and teacher was asking questions and the whole thing was just a drill. And at, at the end of the class, we gave students some games. And this is a kind of design that uh, you see quite often in schools. And if you actually analyze a design of that kind in relation to the curriculum, you will see that it doesn't address any of the capabilities. Definitely is not driven by students' engagement. And, um, and, and it's, it's, it creates an environment where teachers are doing all their work, children are just sitting there and responding accordingly, and it's quite, kind of boring. But, but ped leaving out pedag the pedagogy aspect, what I'm really saying is I am so happy we have this curriculum. And you know what? I'd, as I, I often say, I'm one of the people who actually loves the curriculum. I'm sure that it can be improved. I am also sure that there will never be a perfect curriculum. But what I'm happy about the curriculum is the fact that it's so, but it has these higher order um, thinking skills or higher order uh, skills because it actually allows us to stretch our thinking about what's involved in interaction, so in literacy, in communication, than just simply letters. I'm just going to read the comment from one of our students because I can't. OK. So it's from Leanne. I'll just copy it so other students can see once they log into this collaborate session. Um, I think I, I, I might just, oh my god, do you see it? I agree. Some kids don't have the opportunity to interact with all the people, no grandparents and so on. Making the, these connections to a small group of a particular group of people, old culture, yeah, that's right. Then people in general have a greater empathy for all the people in the same group on a wider scale. Yeah. And what it is, is you know how very often in schools we, are, we, ha we have to connect with the community and very often this ends up to be just family. And I'm saying there's a world out there. Get out from the school. You don't have to always be in the sand pit and, um, you know, and under the tree or on the mat in the classroom. Get out from the school. Have a look. Use resources. And one of the things I have to tell you, I'm old enough to appreciate all the resources which are online because I remember, like, say, even the Google Maps, as simple as, as it seems to, uh, as, sim as simple as the Google Maps seem to be, we didn't have them when I was, you know, younger. We just didn't have any of that. Now there is so much, and with that little game on the map, with the maps and exploring and learning about different ways of representing information, learning about community through Google Maps and so on, it's amazing what we can create. And then you can create another unit of work where you, your children will actually create uh, a map how to get to our school, like this one. This is I created. You know, this is just this was just a concept. So it's really showing how, uh, I mean, this is really bad, but if people click, so you can go to school, look at this, you can walk, and I found this tired person, can you see it? So this is this, um, 
tired person, so you can get to school by walking. You can get to school by riding a bike, like underneath. You can go to school by tuk-tuk, which of course you can't. And then you can use a sports car. And then you can uh, do have this meeting place. You see, in, in Aboriginal cultures, usually the circle is a meeting place. And uh, you know, the, on the left, it's represented as a school, as a lecture theater. But on the right, I have represented it as a as a um, circle. And then you have areas you can use those emu steps that um, you know somewhere where you can actually walk and then somewhere where you can ride the bike and then you you, you can play with the uh, symbols from the aboriginal legend right using aboriginal legend uh, symbols you can actually create a legend for your map this is just me okay this is just a concept just to get people's imagination going there's nothing good about this map other than just things to provoke your imagination everything else looks looks just bad but you know kids will produce amazing things and they can do it using powerpoints they can do it uh, using wordpress you click here you go there you click here you go there you click here you go there and that's a little bit of uh, a story about your school you can create cuttings from your from the google maps to represent the school and then you can actually work with your indigenous culture person in the school to actually create maybe a an aboriginal version of the map of the school you, you know there's an indigenous um officer always in in darwin in the nt schools i don't know about other states but then you can actually engage someone online or you can i don't know whatever the means will be in the schools will have the point is that you can actually learn have different cultures you can engage different culture you can engage different representations of buildings and of uh, movement and of uh, you know whatever and create things so from one where, from one work a unit of work where you actually worked on uh, creating a vignette or creating uh, a book for older people or you know pictures of for older people you can move on to creating us you can move, continue with the concept of the map and now actually children can in the next unit of work create a map an interactive map of their school and then you can go to the next thing and since they have a map of their school then in the next sort of unit of work they can create actually a, a page about their classroom their school right so with different about telling things you know what they do what they like and all of that so you can just literally continue the same uh, you know build build almost in a natural way, which is much more interesting and worthwhile than what I sometimes see. Today we do frogs, tomorrow we will be doing transport, the next uh, fortnight we will be doing a uh, travel agency, and then we will be doing animals in the desert. Right? And if there is no uh, continuity, it's kind of, you know, uh, jumpy. And we don't teach children to think in an aligned, coherent, ongoing way yeah i agree troy curriculum will always be changing and, the, and curriculum doesn't just reflect the new demands of a society although it does it also reflects political swings and god knows what else but we are in the 21st century and no curriculum will ever deny the 21st century skills which is a higher order skills no curriculum will say children might, must just be able to uh, behave obediently right nobody will do it nobody will dare to do it and I'm happy with it because what's actually very often missing from our teaching is that link to the higher order skills because we don't know how to actually work with the curriculum or we don't even know how to work with rich tasks. We don't know how to support rich tasks. And if you actually go through the lesson, lecture one and lecture two today, you will see how we were discussing it, actually. I'll just read this, this text and copy it for others to see. and uh, i'll copy it under my little avatar you should watch how you can use avatar oh my god this is such a good thing especially for preliteracy children you can actually do a lot of things with avatar even when children can't even read and write my daughter is three years uh, my daughter is three three year teacher had them to do a whole term theme across all learning areas one term it was oceans another term was water safety but just as you see you are saying she carried the same theme rather than just learning for the sake of learning right so exactly but the theme um for her it was the theme for her was water 
but for me it's not it's not internet or anything but for me the theme is engagement in the community right because because i draw my theme not from the curriculum but i draw it from the curricular priorities so one will be aged care people another could be what did i say could be creating an online map of a school so it's just a general community thing that you do for anybody just a, just a lovely thing for the school community for the people who for the visitors and the other one i said what was the other one create a web uh, a site of the class of a school and that would be nice if you were to engage a sister school you know everybody has sister schools so um, say in china or some somewhere you know so you actually so this is still about engagement it's still about community engagement so here it's a purpose it's not actually oriented towards a th object like an ocean which i'm not I, I don't have a problem with but it's not about object so this so the theme is not coming from an object but it's coming from actually the cross -cur curricular priorities engagement in the community right and um and then we, we actually explore, we actually explore the community. So different, um, different uh, units of work will be reflecting uh, different ways in which we actually facilitate for children to actually be within the community. But yes, and, the, and, and those units of work, those larger macro tasks are great because children have for a number of weeks, like a whole term, exactly. They have a single focus and they, ex they engage in a creative activity and they collect information, they explore what's relevant, what's not, so they evaluate, which means that they actually do lots of critical thinking and they do it by learning about the society, which is the social, they're learning therefore about themselves, they're learning about how to be, they develop cultural awareness, which is the intercultural element, they learn how to be actually respectful and therefore ethical, and they also learn, and then before, as I said, critical and, and, and in, being critical and also engaging creatively. And just to cover up this little peek into the future, I will take you here. Now, I will still think how I will, whether I will change this graph or not, but at this very second, what you can see here, but basically the design is like you said, the whole term project, it's a project. And on the left, I said, the teacher creates support, which is the, say that those five activities that you will be doing for assignment two will be that support you will be actually designing so the children are supported in their context of reading. So each lesson will be the activities you will design in order to engage student to engage um, student to, to engage the support, right? So activities will be designed in order for children to actually engage the support you created, so that they actually get on with the project. So that's the sort of very simple framework for designing activities. And you can also use this framework for evaluating whether you have actually seen things like that around. So Lian has seen the ocean thing carried on in different ways. People were actually learning about their environment and that's good, but I need still purpose. Every activity has to have an audience. It has to be purpose oriented. Why are we doing this? So even if the theme is ocean, I still want to say, who is the object of my engagement? Because what I would like to avoid is children to do things just for themselves or for the teacher. That's a little bit narrow and not motivating. And doing everything for parents, it's not that interesting because I have actually seen children coming home with all these objects and parents only can give this much time to it. But when children do something like for the aged care people, right, when there is a total event created out of it, um, right, and when, and when all the people really appreciate it and so on, it's, it's, it's a bigger, it's, 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 you are being recognized or appreciated outside of your home area, which is very, very different. I mean, we could do anything. We could actually show to children how to actually, you know, we could, we could create a learning resource. Children can create a learning resource, how to actually um, train dogs for all I care, right? Imagine that. I mean, there's five million things we can do if we, 
permit ourselves, if we're not stuck with the model where we just read Dr. Seuss and then we do, and we don't read Dr. Seuss for a, actually a, a aesthetical experience, but in order to actually learn how to count, oh my God, learn how to count uh, to six or something, right? Because usually these texts are not used for aesthetic experience, but for something else. So the year sevens at my work did the whole time working on business. Great. They had to design, make, market and sell product. Exactly. It was very engaging. Some kids loved it. Some and the kids loved it. Made, uh, most made food. Other groups made something and stress balls. Yeah, exactly. Right. Real things. And then, you know, um, go to the markets and create the market and then, you know, collect some money and tell children that we went to the zoo today and the money for the bus was paid by the scones or by the hacky sacks. I don't know what it is, but it sounds good. You know, whatever we sold at the local markets. Great. Exactly. And they learn about business. They also can learn about business, how to actually do business and what being what doing a business does and all of that. So it's all oriented towards, as I said, be engaging community, being with people, doing things like, you know, if you actually go to the market and make things for the market, it's, it's, you know, learning the business skill, learning how to advertise, learning how to dress to look, you know, um, the way you should, if you actually are representing yourself and trying to sell it. So tomorrow we're going to do the markets and we're going to look nice. You know, the whole concept of self-esteem. I mean, I know that even in Darwin, we very often wear, you know, thongs and boxing shorts, but now teaching children that how you dress does matter. And then tomorrow we're going to the market and we're going to all look nice. Okay, look nice. And then we can actually explore how children look nice. And then we're just going to all look nice. You know, we will make sure that our uniforms look nice. We actually will wear uniforms to be recognizable as children from our school and all of that. We're going to look nice. So that make, will make children think that if they wear uniforms, they look nice, but you know, they will buy it. That's great. And they do look nice in those uniforms. So anyway, it's engagement, doing things for purpose, learning how to do things. So they don't learn literacy because they need to actually be able to tell the difference between A and B. They learn literacy so that they can run a business. Exactly. You could do it even with five-year-olds, six-year-olds. You can do anything. It's just that they obviously will not be learning how to do a uh, Wall Street uh, journal, right? That what they will be doing is basically something... Um, I did click on it. I hope I didn't lose um, the thing. What's this? Let's have a look. I'm going to do that. Um, all right. So now we're learning what these hacky sacks are, right? Uh, what are they, Liam? Can you see my screen? Can you see those balls? Amazing, just amazing. Oh my God. Guatemala worry doll lead legend. Oh my God. And you see, you've got all the cultural experiences straight there. Ah. Oh. I mean, honestly, I don't have to teach you how to teach literacy. You have it. I, I'll, I'll just teach you how to do the tricks with literacy. You know, I'll teach you about tricks. But all of this is there. You know, so it's amazing. You know, we have kids who live in the real world, right? Yeah, they're very cheerful. I agree, Sophia. You know, our kids live in the real world. You know, at the age of five, they can say jokes. They can tell you the movie they watched and all of that. They have full capacity. So whether they're five-year-old or 15-year-old, you know, they live in the real world. Make them connect and use literacy for what literacy has been invented, which is to actually help us to manage our lives. Right? Without the literacy, we wouldn't be able to have accounts. We wouldn't be able to actually... Uh, transfer money, we wouldn't be able to read someone else's thoughts, we wouldn't be able to do lots of things. The literacy was actually designed, we use literacy for the purposes of our culture. So let's get involved in culture and let's just do it. So that's just about it I wanted to cover for the day. 
So I will upload all the three things, which is less lecture one, lecture two, I mean, uh, of t the two hours of the lecture we had on the campus. And the, it has some theory, so it will be very useful if you actually watched it. And then this collaborative session, which you actually have participated in, so you no longer have to watch it, but other people might benefit. Anyway, that's all I wanted to actually cover for the day. Are you all happy? Was it easy? I think it was. Yeah, we will take it through the next so many weeks. But this is exciting. I mean, there is a reason why people do all these things, right? I'm not the only one saying these things. And you know, schools, many schools actually have grown to actually love people doing these things. Um, yeah, and, and for example, when I was talking about the Asian connection as well, which is in the curriculum, like my student who is a literacy teacher in Parap school, she went to an international conference, the university paid for her, but the school said because she's, cre she's actually engaging her school, there's her school in the, in the, in the cross-curriculum priority, which is the Asian connection, they actually paid her for the time she was overseas. So she didn't actually lose her pay, which her salary, which she was very uh, afraid to do, right? So university paid for her trip and, and uh, school paid for her uh, working days. And because she was actually doing things that actually fed into activities that she then does with uh, uh, sister school, which they have, I think, um, Where's her sister school? I forgot by now. I think it's in Japan, right? So she was actually bringing the international experiences back to school. So all of the, all these international experiences are worthwhile. We don't we don't live in a fishbowl, right? A fishbowl is big. It is an ocean, if I could quote Lian's uh, theme. Anyway, um, all right, so I might finish on that note and try congratulations for being math genius. That's great. Um, you know, and you can easily think of ways, yeah, of ways how you can um, engage different uh, learning areas as well. Anyway, so that's just about it for today. And I think that we had a good peek into the future so we know why we're learning all of these capabilities and all of that so that we can see that only in this way we can so basically with the capabilities which need to be addressed and they inform those larger tasks so we can now marry these macro tasks and capabilities and think now how we can create a support so that children can actually uh, engage with those capabilities and therefore we as teachers are actually engaging with the curriculum, which means we are being paid, we are doing for what we are actually being paid. All right, so I will say goodbye to you and I will close the lecture. Thank you guys, thank you for being so good, thank you. It was so good, Amelia, amazing. Troy too, great, thank you. <laughs>